Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. We're so excited. Today we're going to talk about Moses and a history lesson. So today we're going to spe- spend a lot of time looking at history <clears throat> through the book of Deuteronomy. The, sa- the memory text is, and they all ate that same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So Byron, would you pray for us before we start our lesson? Yes, thank you. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the Sabbath day, Lord, to put aside the world that we might have time to spend with you and to learn of your word, Lord, and that we might grow closer to you. So as we read about the history, Lord, the history as Moses explains it, we want to look at our own lives and see what mistakes we might be repeating as well, Lord, and how you might change and transform us. We ask for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that you guide each and every one of us, Lord, that we come closer to you, your similitude, that we let you drive, Lord, and that we stop having an eye problem. And Lord, we pray for everyone watching that they might not only learn of the lesson today, but they might truly take something to heart to bring them closer to you, Lord. Whatever it may be, Lord, that you might have a custom-tailored message for each person watching. We thank you for your mercy and your grace and the sacrifice of your Son, Lord, to predestine all of us for salvation. We thank you for all this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, according to the covenant structure of the book of Moses... His speech begins with a preamble. We see that in Deuteronomy 1 through 5, and we're going to be going through that in a minute, which has two functions. The first, it signals the nature of the content of the book as signified by the phrase, these are the words. These words were referred not only to the words of Moses as a prophet and as a leader of Israel, but also as the words of God. His commandments, which Moses will later explain in Deuteronomy 1.5, and to God's action through the events of history of salvation. Secondly, it situates the place and the time of Moses' last testimony to the people on this side of Jordan or the wilderness side of Jordan before they enter the Promised Land. Then Transjordan, which is the place facing the promised land, and in the 40th year, the last year of Israel's journey in the wilderness. So we see this this, um, taking place in his testimony. These are the words which Moses spoke to all of Israel, and on this side of the Jordan, in the wilderness, in the plain opposite, Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Diazahib. So, thus, we now get into the book of Deuteronomy. Moses and the presence of Moses dominate the book, for these are the opening words to to his death in the land of Moab. And we see that in Deuteronomy 34, 5. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. Deuteronomy, as the whole Bible, is really about Jesus. Even though Moses is talking and we see him throughout, it's really all about Christ. For in Genesis, we see that if we look at Genesis 1 and 2, we see that Jesus was the one who created us. John first John 1, 1 to 3 shows that he sustains us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that was made. And we also see his sustaining in, Galatian, in Colossians 1, 15 through 17. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, All things have been created through him 
and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So we see this sustaining that God does. He created us, and he continues to walk with us. Then we see him redeeming us. We see that also in Hebrews uh, 1.3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down on the right hand of his majesty in heaven. So we see that God, once his work here on earth was done, he sat by the Father, and he continues to uh, work for us today. In Isaiah 41, 14, we see, Do not be afraid, for whom uh, Jacob, little Israel, do not fear, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And then in Titus uh, 2.14, we see, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So as we move through the book of, Deuter- the, the book of Deuteronomy, there are two key phrases that I want to point out that we need to be looking for. And these are expression, the Lord our God and the Lord your God. They serve as golden threads throughout the book. The Lord our God is found 23 times throughout the book. They are present in all three sermons of Moses, linking the entire book together. They also point to a close relationship between the Lord and Israel. The Lord is the personal God of his people. He is Yahweh and Elohim. He is transcendent, yet also their eminent and close God. He is the God of the covenant. These two dimensions of Israel's deity emphasize, but the weight of their meaning is personal. Intimate connection between God and his people, Moses stresses that the Lord your and is your and our God. These expressions identify the Lord and his relationship with his people. So basically, just as the children of Israel are finally to enter Canaan, Moses gives them this history lesson, a theme that is repeated all through the Bible, which is love, obey, and fear God. And don't forget what he's done in the past. We see this, Ellen White tells, talks about this in Life Sketches. This admonition should mean something to us. We are on the borders of the promised land. In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I am fulfilled with astonishment, she says. I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us in the past and his teachings of our past history. So for us to strengthen our faith and to know that God will be with us in the future, we need to remember what he's done for us in the past. And in testimonies, she says, it is just as essential that the people of God in this day should bear in mind how and when they have been tested. So we're to remember our tests and where their faith has failed. Now that's, not many of us like to think about our failures. Where they have imperiled his cause by their unbelief and also by their self-confidence. God's mercy, his sustaining providence, his never-to-be-forgotten deliverances are to be recounted step by step. As God's people thus review the past, they should see that the Lord is ever repeating his dealings. They should understand that the warnings given and should be aware not to repeat their mistakes. Renouncing all self-dependence, they are to trust him to save them from, again, dishonoring his name. So the themes are going to be hope, God fights for us, God fulfills his words, and his grace and justice. So, Scott, would you like to talk to us about the ministry of Moses? Certainly. 
Thank you for the introduction. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about the ministry of Moses. So I thought, first of all, October 3rd is also my dad's birthday. So I thought it was kind of an interesting coincidence that I got to do October 3rd. <laughs> um, Good. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about the ministry of Moses. And it says, all through the Bible, the presence of Moses is felt. And uh, though he's not mentioned until Exodus chapter 2, verse 2, he had written the book of Genesis, God's authoritative and foundational story of who we are, how we got here, why things are as bad as they are, and yet why we can hope uh, anyway. Creation, the fall, the promise of redemption, the flood, Abraham and the gospel, all have their roots in Genesis, and its author was the prophet Moses. It's hard to gauge adequately the influence that one man, hardly flawless, was nevertheless able to exert for God because he loved the Lord and wanted to serve him. And so it's interesting to me that it seems the most, um, how should I put it, the most fundamental and most important author of the Old Testament was Moses, and for the New Testament it would have been Paul. So I think Moses and Paul were both had many things in common. They were both highly educated, and they both started off being educated um, not necessarily directly by God, but being educated in the best knowledge that their scientific uh, colleagues had at the time. So Moses was trained by uh, the Pharaoh to be uh, knowledgeable in all the arts of um, war and all the arts of diplomacy, the, all the science that Egypt had. So basically the best schooling that was available in Egypt at the time when he was alive, he, he got that schooling. So that made him probably one of the most educated people in the Bible, along with Paul in the New Testament. Um, so one of the interesting things we used to do in high school was to um, go over history lessons and kind of put ourselves in the position of the people at that time um, and trying to figure out how we would have solved the issue using our 2020 hindsight. Um, and we frequently reverted to when we couldn't solve a problem, was if we just nuked them, that would eventually solve the problem. So um, that was one of the ways, though, that made his history interesting to me, is trying to put yourself in the position of the person uh, when the original event occurred. So then um, I was also looking at the definition of what does Deuteronomy mean? So it comes from the Greek Deuteronomian, which means a second law or repeated law. But apparently the Hebrew title for the book was called Debarin, which means the words. So I felt like in some sense Moses acted as a type of Christ in this book. And um, we can see that fulfilled when we read that Exodus um, 32, 29 through 32, so I'm going to go ahead and read that, which says, Moses said, Dedicate yourselves to the Lord, for every man has been ag against his son and against his brother, in order that he may bestow a blessing on you today. And on the next day, Moses said to the people, You yourselves have committed a great sin. Now I am going to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now, if you will, forgive their sins uh, very well. But if not, please wipe me out of your book, which you have written. So in that sense, Moses is pleading as an intercessor for the people of Israel, which is ultimately what Christ did in the New Testament, only um, with Moses, God did not allow Moses to um, take on the sin of the people, but he did allow his son Jesus Christ to take on our sins and substitute his good behavior for, for our bad behavior. Um, and it, it explains it a little bit further in the lesson. It says, even though Moses had nothing to do with the sin, just like Christ had nothing to do with our sins, he sought to intercede on behalf of the sinful people. 
even being willing to lose his own soul on their behalf. Fascinatingly enough, when Moses asks God to forgive their sin, the ver verb actually means to bear. Thus, uh, Moses, understanding the gravity of the sin and what it took to atone for it, asked God to bear their sin. And in this, and that is because this is the only way ultimately that sin, any sin, could be forgiven. Thus we have in the early Bible a powerful expression of the substitution in which God himself in the person of Jesus will bear himself the full brunt of the penalty of our sin. God's preordained way of salvation for humanity while remaining true to the principles of his government and law. Uh, many centuries later, Peter would write, uh, Jesus, who himself having borne our sins uh, in his own body on the tree, that is, having died to sins, might live to righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Meanwhile, uh, what we see in the story of Moses and his reaction to their sin is Moses' role of intercessor on, be on behalf of a fallen sinful people, a precursor of Jesus, who will all, um, of what Jesus will also do for us. Um, so I, I think that the most important part out of this is that Christ loved the world enough that he was willing to die for us, and it seemed like Moses was willing to offer the same kind of sacrifice that he was willing to offer even his own eternal salvation in order to save his people of Israel. So I think this is a worthy example of being Im imitated by us. That is, that we should love our neighbor enough that would be willing to die for them, as Christ did. So with that, we'll move on to the next day. Thank you. Okay, Byron, talk about us. Talk to us about fulfilled prophecy. Fulfilled prophecy. You know, I, I love the detailed stuff like this. So we're going to start off by reading um, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness. And the Arabah opposite Suf, I know these are all the wonderful names, between Paran and Tophel, and Laban, and Hazaroth, and Dizahbab. It is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke with the, um, to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had commanded him to give to them. After he had defeated Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Azeroth and Eldrai, across the Jordan and in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound this law, saying, The Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb, saying, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. And we've covered this previously, that basically they needed a refresher course in the law because they were all 19 or younger 40 years ago. And we see at when the rebellion occurred at Kadesh Barnea. So now there's a new generation in Israel. They were all 19 and younger back then, but this is the fulfillment of that 40-year prophecy that was mentioned in Numbers 14.34, and we'll read, According to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days, for every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you will know my opposition. So we see the fulfillment of that. But someone could easily say, you know, that prophecy, so God said, oh, in 40 years, you're gonna, everyone's going to die off or we're going to come back. That's kind of almost, it doesn't seem that major of a prophecy per se. God was still in, in controlling the whole thing, right? He could tell him to do whatever he wanted. So let's look at some other prophecy. Let's look a little deeper, and we're going to look at um, Daniel chapter 2. And if we don't have time, we'll just go over this briefly. There was a statue, and the head that King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. The statue had a head of gold, mm -hmm. and then the arms were silver, and the breast, the belly and thighs were bronze, and the legs were iron, and the feet were partly iron and partly clay. And we know from this, and mind you, this prophecy was given at the time of Babylon. 
So that was the time of the golden head. The Medo-Persian Empire were the arms of silver and breast of silver. The belly and, th and, and thighs of bronze represented the Greek Empire. First Alexander the Great, and then later the four generals that divided up his kingdom, and there's even prophecy in that um, in Daniel and Revelation. Um, the legs of iron represented the Roman Empire, and the feet partly of iron and clay, partly of clay, were the breakup of the Roman Empire, which is where we are today. And the very last part of that prophecy is a stone that is, um, comes that is not cut with hands, that strikes the statue, pulverizes it to dust, and then grows into a mountain, which will be the kingdom that Christ will establish himself. It's the only part of that prophecy we're waiting on. Isn't it nice that hindsight is 2020 looking at these things, and we can see just how true God's prophecy is? So one of my favorite prophecies is in Isaiah, and he talks about Cyrus, and it's um, chapter 45, verses 1 through 3, and verse 13. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by my right hand, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through the iron, their iron bars. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. In verse 13, I have aroused in him righteousness, this is Cyrus, and I will make all his ways smooth. He will build my city, that's referring to Jerusalem, and will let my exiles go free without any payment or reward, says the Lord of hosts. We see here that God is prophesizing about using Cyrus. And we actually even see in Jeremiah more of this prophecy about the 70 years that Judah will be in exile. That's Jeremiah 25, 11. This whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So we look at this. Isaiah was written about 150 years before Cyrus did this. Cyrus wasn't even a twinkle in anybody's eye. 70 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, Cyrus is conquering Babylon and puts a decree out that the Jews can return to Jerusalem and rebuild it. So we have three different books, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and actually Daniel, um, that speak of this, because in Daniel 7.20, or I'm saying, actually Daniel talks about the actual conquering of the time in chapter 5, and we see three different books over a span of 150 years. God's prophecy is rock solid. We can see more about the prophecy of the beast, and he will, in Daniel 7, 25, he will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One. And he will intend to make alterations in times in the law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Just so we know, a time is one year, times is two years, and half a time is six months. Revelation 12, 6 says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God. And she was there and would be nourished for 1,260 days. And Revelation 13, 5 says, There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. And authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Now if we calculate this, there's 30 days in a Jewish month, which means there's 360 days in a year. So... We have one year and two years and a half year for Daniel 7.25, which is 1,260 days. Revelation 12.6 clearly says 1,260 days. And Revelation 13.5 says 42 months. 42 times 30 days is 1,260 days. All referring to the time that the beast would be in power until he received the deadly wound. This is what we know as the Dark Ages. In 538 A.D., Emperor Justinian transitioned from an emperor, a soldier, to a theologian. 
basically competing directly with the Pope of Rome. He persecuted heretics, etc. And he literally did this because of a power struggle that they were having. In 1798, Pope Pius VI, refusing to renounce his temporal power, was basically taken prisoner by the general for Napoleon and died 18 months later in prison. That would be the deadly wound. So what's the point of all this? All this prophecy that we see that's come to pass. Well, I'll say this. In Acts 5, 34 through 39, after Peter has been arrested again, and I believe it's John with them, but a Pharisee named Gamaliel, that would be Paul's teacher, a teacher of the law respected all, by all the people stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to the men of Israel, take care of what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan is um, action of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. So what happened with the church? Did it dwindle after Jesus died or he ascended to heaven? Or did it grow exponentially? We know that this is the truth. We know that Paul persecuted the way, as it was called, that sect they were trying to get rid of. But we know that God's prophecy is spot on. And that he's not wrong. And if he had all of these things right in the beginning... The few that are left are sure and true. So I have to ask you, are you ready for a second coming? Are your tr lamps trimmed and full of oil for, to meet your bridegroom? Okay, we're going to talk about a thousand times more numerous. And um, I thought that was kind of an odd topic until I got deeper into the study. But we see that the children of Israel has had the long trek across the wilderness. They've just slain the two kings, decimating the Amorites. Moses, speaking for the Lord, he was the prophet, though indeed more than a prophet, as we see here, as he speaks for God. He said to the people in Deuteronomy 1.8, See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to give them to them, their descendants after them. So he starts out by reminding the people of God's covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and how they are a fulfillment of this covenant. Then, but, but notice what he says next in Deuteronomy 9. That's kind of interesting. And it says, In that time I said to you, you are too heavy a burden for me to carry alone. So he tells them that he told God that they were just too much for him. The Lord your God has increased your numbers so that today you are as numerous as the sky. May the Lord, the God of your ancestors, increase you a thousand times and bless you as he has promised. So we see that he's asking God to bless the, the Israelites, but it was also a huge burden to him. And so we'll see how, um, how as, as we go along, how God works through this issue of being too much of a burden for him. But we see other examples of God's graciousness. Even amid the wilderness wanderings, they were blessed. <clears throat> we see in Ni Nehemiah 20, 921, it says, 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out. Their feet did not swell. And if you can imagine wandering around the, the desert, in that hot desert, with the sand burning your feet for 40 years, and your feet not swelling, that's amazing. And Moses, again, showing his love for his people, asked God to multiply them 
a thousand more than what he had already done. So now, back to the issue of Moses said the burden was so heavy. We pick up in Deuteronomy 1.12, but how can I bear your problems and your burdens and your disputes all by myself? Choose some wise men of understanding and respected men from each of your tribes, and I will set them over you. So God's helping Moses organize the, the camp. You answered me, what you purpose to do is good. So I took the leading men of your tribes, wise and respected men, and appointed them to have authority over you. As commander of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, of tens, and as tribal officials. And I charged your judges at the time. Hear the disputes between your people and judge fairly whether the case is between you, two Israelites, or between an Israelite and a foreigner residing among you. Do not show partiality in judging. Hear both small and great alike. Do not be afraid of anyone, for judgment belongs to God. Bring me any case too hard for you, and I will hear it. So God had Moses set up uh, an organized structure that was, gave him the ability to lead and not be completely overwhelmed. And Ellen White talks about this organization in Patriarchs and Prophets. Thus, even when the Lord was so powerfully present among them, there was a need for organization, for structure, for a system of accountability. Israel was a kahal, an organized assembly. The government of Israel was characterized by the most thorough organization, wonderful alike for its completeness and its simplicity. The order is so striking displayed in the perfection and arrangement of all God's created works was manifest in the Hebrew economy. God was the center of authority and government and the sovereign of Israel. Moses stood as their leader by God's appointment to administer the laws in his name. From the elders of the tribes, a council of 70 was afterward chosen to assist Moses in the general affairs of the nation. Next came the priests who consulted the, God, the Lord in the sanctuary. Chiefs or princes ruled over the tribes. Under these were captains over thousands, captains over hundreds, and captains over fifties, and captains over ten. And lastly, officers who might be employed for specific duties. The Hebrew camp was arranged in exact order. It was separated into three divisions, each having its appointed position in the encampment. In the center of the tabernacle, the abiding place of the invisible king, around it were stationed priests and Levites. Beyond the camp were all the other tribes. So we see that God put, helped Moses by putting in a, a wonderful organizational structure. We see, this, we see a new structure then, a similar structure in the New Testament. Um, and um, the New Testament war, which is the, uh, in Greek is called ecclesia, or the church. So Matthew 16, 18 tells us, And I tell you that you, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And through different, in a different context, Paul was never far from his Jewish roots. And in 1 Corinthians 1, 12, we see him clearly delineating the need for qualified people to assume various roles for the proper function of the body, just as we see in Deuteronomy and the Kahal in the wilderness. The church today, as the Kahal back then, needs to be a unified body fulfilling various roles. And we're going to look at just a few things. We're going to go quickly through uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 13. But it talks about the diversities and gifts of the same spirit. So there's differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but is the same God who works in us all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So we see, um, we're gonna, we, we look at, at several different qualities that the, the spirit got, 
gives people uh, wisdom through the Spirit, the word of knowledge, same Spirit, gifts of healing, working miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongue and interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works in all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one, has many members, but all members of that one body, being many, are one body also in Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into the body, whether we're Jews, Gentiles, slaves, or free, and all have been made to drink of that one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And so it takes all of us and God's Spirit to help organize our own church today. Uh, Acts of the Apostles said, God is not the author of confusion. So this is for why we have the organization, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. He requires that order and system be observed in the conduct of church affairs today, no less than in the days of old. He desires his work to be carried forward with thoroughness and exactness so that he may place upon it the seal of his approval. Christians, Christian is to be united with Christian, church with church, the human instrumentality cooperating with the divine, every agency subordinated to the Holy Spirit and combined in giving to the world the good tidings and the grace of God. Though we sometimes hear people rail against the church, it is still this organized body that is God's body. Okay, Scott, tell right. us about Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea. Because it was a problem. Yes, it was Kadesh a problem. Kadesh Barnea was a problem. <laughs> so I found this interesting <laughs> commentary about Kadesh Barnea. So, by the way, do you know what Kadesh Barnea means? What does it mean? It means the holy place of the desert wandering. And it's located in the desert of Zin, which to me sounds a lot like the desert of Sin. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I, I think there's some interesting parallels between the ancient people of Israel who were unwilling to trust God's promise. So God told them, well, as a result of your sin, you're going to die in that desert of Zin, uh, as opposed to going into the promised land. So it says... Um, it is located somewhere on the border of Edom and Israel, southwest of the Dead Sea. Kadesh some, Barnea, sometimes called Kadesh, is connected to many significant in, events in Israel history, specific, specifically in the Pentateuch. Uh, <clears throat> it is a place of combat in the book of Genesis when Abraham fought the Amalekites. And it is ironic that the very place where Abraham experienced victory over the Amalekites is where the Israel... Israelites later failed to believe God would give him victory in acquiring the promised land. Uh, according to Genesis also includes Hagar's meeting with the angel of the Lord between Kadesh and Bered after she was mistreated by Sarah. Kadesh seems to have been a regular camping spot for the Israelites throughout their years in the desert and it was at Kadesh that Mir Miriam died and was buried. Uh, another two significant events that occurred at Kadesh were, were the Israelites' faithless, uh, faithlessness, refusal to possess the promised land, and their opposition to Moses. And th this is the one we're going to focus on a little bit now. So I'm going to read a little bit, though I'll, I'll read only part of um, Numbers chapter 14. I'll read from verses 11 through 20. Um, and Moses said, how long will these uh, people be disrespectful to me? And how long will they not believe me, despite all the signs I have performed in their midst? I will strike them with a plague and dispossess them, and I will make you a nation greater and mightier than they. But Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear of it, for by your strength you brought us up from their midst. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land that they have heard that you, the Lord, are in the midst of the people. And because you, Lord, are seen eye to eye, 
while uh, your cloud stands over them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now if you put this people to death all at once, then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, Since the Lord could not bring him from the people into the land which he promised them by oath, he slaughtered them in the wilderness. So now please, let the power of the Lord be great, just as you have declared, saying, The Lord is slow to anger and abundant in mercy, forgiving the wrongdoing and the violation of his law, but he will by no means uh, leave the guilty unpunished, inflicting their punishment of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Please forgive the guilt of these people in accordance with your great mercy, uh, just as you have also forgiven the people from Egypt even until now. So the Lord said, I have forgiven them in accordance with your word. However, as I live, all the earth be filled with the glory of the Lord. Certainly all the people who have seen my glory and my signs which I performed in Egypt in the wilderness, yet have put me to this test these ten times and have not listened to me, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor any of those who disrespected me to see it. So anyway, the, 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 what I'm getting out of this is that basically, even though God had um, allowed the people ten times to murmur against him, that on this tenth time when it was the most serious, that God would no longer put up with it. So while he did listen to Moses and forgave the people of Israel, uh, yet there was still a consequence, and there there consequences that he was to they were to uh, wander in the desert forty days, which was a day for each um, a year for each day uh, that the spies had been in spying out the land, which was forty days. And it's also interesting that the church in the wilderness, and I don't know if uh, if you were going to comment on this at some point, Byron, but. The church in the wilderness was wandering in the desert for 42 months, uh, which was 1260 years, which was the year of, of the time that the um, papal supremacy lasted. So the, the word of God was suppressed for that period of time. So it's an interesting parallel that this number of 40 seems to be uh, kind of a, a trial period. Um, so... Anyway, continuing on. Um, and then the Lord spoke to Moses again, saying, How long shall I put up with this evil congregation that are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are voicing against me, uh, and say to them, As I live, declares the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so will I do to you. Your dead bodies will fall in this wilderness, and all of you numbered according to your complete number from 20 years old and upwards who have grumbled against me. By no means will you come in the land where I swore to settle, except for Caleb and the son of Jepuna and Joshua, the son of Nun. So, uh, so God, even though he's forgiving, he does put consequences on his people who don't listen to his words. Um, and the other important part to, to learn from here was the part that um, Moses was even more worried about the honor of God than he was worried about his own uh, self or about even his own salvation, and that he, he didn't want God's name to be um, profaned or, or, or not taken seriously by the people of the land as a result of uh, the destruction. So if God were to have destroyed the people of Israel before they reached the promised land, then that would bring dishonor to God. So I guess the uh, important part for us to learn out of this is that every time we disobey God, we not only create problems for ourselves, but we're also um, dishonoring God's name, which I think our, our top priority should be to <clears throat> honor the name of God. And, and so I think there could be many situations when we're encountering um, difficult times, as did uh, the, the people of Israel. They seemingly unconquerable un, um, people that were giants in the land, but yet 
they needed to trust God that if he said, you know, they could be conquered, um, that was going to be exactly what happened. And that's what Joshua and Caleb uh, believed. And as they believed, so it happened to them. So they were the only two of the Israelites who, who did end up entering, the, the two who had faith. So the point of this is to copy the example of the two good spies, that Caleb and jo <coughs> Joshua, who are willing to take God at his word and not to be intimidated by difficult circumstances that seemed unsurmountable to the people. So we are to just obey God no matter how impossible the circumstances seem. And even when it doesn't seem to make any sense, how, how are we to get out of this situation? And I think now we're encountering many situations in the world where it seems like we're being put in impossible situations, but we're still to have faith. So I'll end with that. Amen. Byron, you're going to talk to us about the iniquity of the Amorites. Now, I understand that the Amorites could, did just about anything evil you could think of. Well, and everything evil not, you not, could think of. Not always. <laughs> not always. So. Well, we're going to start off with um, Genesis 15. Um, I had 6 through 16, but I'm going to paraphrase verses 6 through 12 and start reading 13 through 16. Um, si verses 6 through 12 are the, um, basically the animal halves covenant, and only God walks through, basically declaring to Abraham or Abram at that time that um, his word is true. Otherwise, God would literally stake his life on it. And we studied this previously. And starting in verse 13, God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and, impressed 400, and oppressed 400 years. But I will judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace." You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, there, they will return here. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So first of all, what is iniquity? Simply put, it's gross injustice or wickedness. Let's just call it what it is, sin. So, but their sin wasn't complete yet. So what does that mean? Is repenting still an option? Yes, they can yet be saved. God will not wipe out anyone if there's any chance that they can be saved. And I cannot stress that point enough. And we're going to look at this. So now, though, after this 400 years, the iniquity of the Amorites is complete, really all of Canaan. And we know that there were God believers before with um, Melchizedek, the king of Salem. But... At this point in time, 400 years later, they're gone. And it's only pagan worship, and they're so far gone, they can't even repent. They're considered lost by God. And yet, is everyone? Because I want to read something from Joshua 2, 8 through 11. Now, before they lay down, she came to the roof, uh, or to them on the roof. And they're talking about um, the spies with Rahab. And said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven, above and on earth beneath. In other words, he covers everywhere. Now, therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters with all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. 
So was all of Canaan wiped out? No. Rahab and her father's household lived, and why? Because they believed. They knew about this since the Red Sea, since 40 years ago. And they're the only ones who had the, the faith to step out and trust God could deliver them. God is not in the business of wiping out people who can be saved. And her household is. And speaking of Rahab, what lineage is she involved in? Hmm. Perhaps Jesus? Mm hmm So we see this, and we see how God can use anybody, but they have to be a willing participant. So let's take a look at the flood. Only eight people survived, right? Everyone else was destroyed. Men, women, children, infants, everything. Did they just have any warning at all? We're going to read Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 92. Amid the prevailing corruption, Methuselah, Noah, and many others labored to keep alive the knowledge of the true God and to stay the tide of moral evil. A hundred and twenty years before the flood, the Lord by a holy angel declared to Noah his purpose and directed him to build an ark. While building the ark, he was to preach that God would bring a flood of water upon the earth to destroy the wicked. Those who would believe the message and would prepare for that event by repentance and reformation should find pardon and be saved. Enoch had repeated to his children what God had shown him in regard to the flood, and Methuselah and his sons, who lived to hear the preaching of Noah, assisted in building the ark. Now we know Methuselah passed away, and there were other people that, that passed away before the flood came. And actually he passed away in the year of the flood. Right. His name actually means that at his death it will come or it will happen. So on the same year he died, the flood came. So, but we look at this. Did God desire to save these people? 120 years they were preaching. And yet, when the flood came, only eight were saved. The, all the rest of them were beyond redemption. Not by God's choice, by their own. How about Sodom and Gomorrah? Genesis 18:20. the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is ex exceedingly grave. Now, if God is hearing this, and it is believed that it's so bad, the angels are actually complaining to God. Abraham tries bargaining with God, and he gets it down to ten righteous people. And we read in Genesis 19, 1 through 11, which will just paraphrase here the angels come into the city and Lot meets them at the gate he knows what a wicked city it is so he invites them to come over his roof to have that covenant arrangement I believe it was normally for three days in the Middle East for protection they want to stay in the square but he convinces them then the inhabitants of Sodom of Sodom come because they know they're there and basically want to know the men in a biblical way. Lot offers his two virgin daughters as compensation. They're like, no, we're going to do worse to you than what we're going to do to them, Lot. And then the angels intercede and cause blindness and save Lot. They pull him out of the city. So Lot, his wife, and his two daughters are saved. And we know what happened. Wife Slot looked back and became a pillar of salt. His two daughters get him inebriated and basically lie with them to beget children. I'm going to say that I think Lot was the only one who had moral fiber in that entire city. And it was so bad that God executed judgment. Now you have to remember there's two phases to judgment. There is the actual verdict or decision whether you're guilty or not and then there's the execution of that judgment so we see the execution of that judgment in these wiping people out because God is literally saving them from themselves and the miserable miserable lives that they will have we see that in first Samuel 15 2 or 3 with Amalek 
And God says, wipe them out, even the animals. It's so bad. We see in Numbers 14, 36, and 37, those 10 spies, mm -hmm. they actually are killed by a plague. Interesting. God singles them out. They don't die by natural causes. God executes judgment on them as well. In Numbers 14, 28 and 29, we see that, that the rest of them were to die in the wilderness, but it's still a form of judgment. It's just more kind. But I think there was an interesting part with the people of Sodom that Abraham actually went to save those people. Um, right. From, tried to. He, Abraham tried to save the people from the five kings, I think it was of the Canaanites that conquered them, and then Abraham delivered them. So they kind of got a warning that God was not pleased with them. Right. And even, I mean, they've, they've been getting warnings, but we understand, and even Lot was a warning to them in there. So what about us today? We know that Christ has died for us to cover our sin, uh, to make us righteous so that we don't participate in the second death, right? And the condemn condemnation, that we don't face that judgment. So, we're, are we taking opp are the opportunity that God has offered us through his son that we might have eternal life? Are we surrendering all to the Lord and being true disciples? And if we're not, then we're going to be judged on the other side. So for final thoughts... They say history repeats itself, right? And this is about Moses and the history. And actually, Albert Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. We see it in human history. We see it in the Bible. Over and over again, they do the exact same thing, and they fall into the same pitfalls. Or as Solomon put it in Ecclesiastes 1, 9, and 10, that which has been is that which will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. And if any, if there, and is there anything of which one might say, see this, it is new. Already it has existed for ages, which were before us. So leave us to our own devices and we have not a chance. We will repeat the same mistakes over and over again. But 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. The only way we're going to ever let go of the past is to be that new creature in Christ and to let those old habits die so that we can be not only a new creature in Christ, but we can bypass those mistakes from the past through God's wisdom and grace so that we might serve him for the future. Thank you. It, it amazes me that even as wicked as the Amorites were, God gave them time to try to... 400 more years. To, to change. God is so merciful. Scott. So I'll, I'll use the verse that I, I didn't get to at the end of my other day, which is Ephesians 3.10, so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So I think that could be a good mission statement for us as individuals and us as a church to make known the multifaceted wisdom of God not just to other people, but even to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So that I think God uses us as examples, even as he used Job as an example to Satan. Have you seen my servant Job? So hopefully God will use us as a positive example. Have you seen our servants in Laguna Niguel, how great of a work they're doing? So... May, may the Lord help us to, to be a positive examples in the world. Thank you. And my plea is, um, as I look at um, Tuesday's lesson with organization, my plea to us as a church is that we get involved. Every person in the tribe in, in Israel, every, every child in Israel had a job to do for, for God. God was the center. And that should be our lives as well. So I encourage everyone to get involved somehow and work for God. 
Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I want to thank you, Lord, for this wonderful lesson that we have had today, Lord. We know and see your mercy. We see your grace in everything. We see how you led the children of Israel. We see how you lead our lives today, Lord. We thank you that your presence is always with us, that you walk with us, that you keep us on the straight path so we don't turn to the right or to the left. We pray, Lord, that as we go through the rest of the Sabbath, you will be with us, that we will spend the day communing with you. And Lord, I just pray that each one of us will determine in their heart what they can do for you and do it with passion. So thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath.